Well, greetings all. Joseph Kursky here, Cancerina Kernia, my colleague and I are just so happy that you've joined us for the November Higher Education GIS Chat. These have been wonderful, bringing the community together. And every month we have a fascinating topic that seems to be gathering interest over time, that more and more people are joining us and more and more people are watching the recording. So we're, we're going to continue them. Uh, my colleague, Cancerina, is going to talk about future chats here in a bit. But today, uh, We've been looking forward to this for several weeks now, folks. Today, we've got our colleague from ESRI, Flora Vale, on with us to talk about, as you can see here, visualizing data with charts in ArcGIS Pro and in ArcGIS Online. This is going to be extremely relevant and exciting looking at these capabilities. Flora's got a fascinating background. I know that many of you, probably all of you, are involved with education at some point. Um, either part-time or full-time. And just encourage your students that look at Flora's pathway. Flora's got a PhD in information systems and technology with a focus on data science. And for- Working on it. I have not, I have not earned it yet. Working on it. It's, it's a pathway. Progress. It's, a, it's in progress. <laughs> but uh, Flora is product engineer, spatial analysis, and data visualization. Flora's got a really fascinating job, and she brings a lot of expertise in here, and she's a great communicator and educator. So, Flora, thanks so much for joining us uh, for this higher education chat for November. Thanks for having me. Before we hand it over to Flora, I just want to give the announcement of upcoming chat sessions. So because everybody going to be busy with the Thanksgiving, with the Christmas holiday, we want to make sure that this is in your agenda. Okay. Um, okay, let me just enable somebody would like enable the transcript. So uh, we have a very good topics actually. Many of you asking for the topic of arcade. So this is the um, scripting language that can be used across multiple applications. So we're gonna have the session in December for getting to know ArcGIS Arcade and how to leverage it in various applications. Okay? And we have two presenters for that. And then the next one in December, uh, in January, sorry, in January, I know it's early, January 4th, we have what's new in special statistic tools in ArcGIS Pro. And we have two speakers as well from the same team, like Flora. And this is, uh, this is important because in December, and Flora can also uh, probably um, add into this, we're gonna release the new version for ArcGIS Pro. So it's a lot of exciting things that's happening now and also the upcoming release. Okay. And as always, we have the link to all this um, chat. You can pre-register now, it's up and running and open. I'm gonna put the link in the chat. With that, I'm gonna stop share and hand it over to Flora. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Cancer. And thank you, Joseph, for having me. This is... Um, exciting. I haven't gotten to present a lot during COVID and I really do enjoy um, teaching. So I'm really happy to be here and good morning to everyone. Uh, do you see my slides just, just to confirm? Yeah. Okay, great. Good morning to everyone or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, like you've just heard, I'm a product engineer. I work on the analysis and geoprocessing development team at Esri. So I work on building the charting tools that we're gonna see today. So both in Pro and in ArcGIS Online. There are some other charting capabilities throughout Esri and other places such as dashboards or insights. I am not um, working on those projects, so I'm not the expert there, but I'm gonna show you some data visualization, best practices, and then we're gonna look at some demos in Pro and in ArcGIS Online. So I always like to start with talking a little bit about data visualization and the purpose of data visualization and what it kind of means. And so I think of data viz as providing these three main functions. The first is to explore your data. When you get a new data set, you need to see it in order to understand it. And so there's a lot that you can do with charts to get to know your data. And then we use charts to interpret our analysis results. So oftentimes we have complex analyses with 
multiple dimensions and we need charts in addition to maps in order to understand and interpret our analysis results. And then lastly, we communicate our findings with visualization. And so after we've explored our data and we've done our amazing analysis, we need to be able to communicate that to other people in order for our analysis to be useful. And so charts are also a really great way to tell a data story. So what is data visualization? Simply put, data visualization is a graphical representation of data. So it's the use of symbols as metaphors to represent quantities and categories and context, allowing us to quickly make comparisons and intuit proportions, patterns, relationships, and trends. And quickly, here are some examples of the classics. Um, you didn't think that you were going to get through a data viz talk um, at, an, at an Esri event without seeing a Jon Snow cholera map, did you? And don't worry, I won't spend too long here. I think a lot of us might be already familiar with Jon Snow's amazing cholera map. But the reason that you see this at every data viz talk is because it really was truly transformative. In each of these examples, visualizing the data not only made it easier to process, but it also uncovered insights that would have been virtually impossible to find without the actual visual representation. So we have Jon Snow. He was able to pinpoint the contaminated water tap by identifying a spatial cluster of cholera cases. Um, and then next up, we have Florence Nightingale. She was able to show that epidemic disease was causing more British deaths than battle wounds during the Crimean War. Charles Menard elegantly incorporated several dimensions, including time, location, number of deaths, and temperature into one visualization, telling the story of Napoleon's march. And then uh, lastly, not as historic, but nearly as iconic, Hans Rosling wowed the world with his animated visualizations of global life expectancy changes over time in his 2006 TED Talk. So, in summary, we visualize data to convert slow reasoning tasks into fast perception tasks so that we can intuitively perceive relative differences instead of having to hold information in memory and perform mental calculations. This process of visual perception is called pre-attentive processing, which means that it happens automatically. There's no effort in contrast to attentive processing, which requires conscious effort and some calculation. So for example, if I were to ask you to identify the largest value on this slide, it would be a pretty tedious task requiring a lot of attentive processing. You'd have to consciously search through and sort and it would require quite a bit of memory and effort. But in contrast, if I were to identify, if I were to show you this bar chart and ask you to identify the largest value, you'd know it instantly. You don't have to do any processing, any intensive processing. You can just see the tallest bar. And that's because these values are now represented as visual variables. In 1967, a French cartographer named Jacques Bertin published what, we, what has now become a fundamental reference in data visualization theory titled Semiology of Graphics. And in this book, he describes visual variables and how they can be used to communicate data visually. So more work has been done on this since, but these original visual variables are still the foundation of most visualizations. So we have position, size, shape, value, hue, orientation, and texture. So in this visualization, we're perceiving the relative length of the bars by comparing the position of their endpoint. And many researchers agree that position is the visual variable that we are best at distinguishing. So of course we could also use size or hue, orientation or any other visual variable to make that text stand out. But not all visual variables are appropriate for every data type. In this great chart, uh, Noah Alinsky, who is a thought leader in the data visualization space, put together this great table detailing best practices for visual encodings. So for example, size is a great way to represent quantitative and ordinal data, but it's not really appropriate for categorical data. 
or color can be a good way to represent categorical data, but only when there are few categories. So all of this is important to keep in mind because not all visualizations are created equally. Understanding how our eyes and our brains perceive visual variables is key for effectively communicating through data visualizations. So let's take a look at some examples. Go ahead and get this one out of the way. Pie charts, though beloved by many, they're really just not the most effective way to represent proportions. Understanding a pie chart requires us to visually compare angles which can be difficult to do, especially when there are many present. So looking at these three charts, it's really not immediately apparent which slices are largest in each pie, right? Of course, we could take some time to figure it out, but that would take some effort and you know, maybe even a protractor, when instead we could just use bars. And now we don't need any attentive processing. As I mentioned earlier, we're really good at perceiving length and position, and the bar charts are obviously and immediately distinguishable, right? We don't have to do any sort of calculations. We know which bars are tallest and which are shortest. We wanna get the information with the least amount of effort and the least amount of time. And with the bars, we just get it. We don't have to figure it out. Okay, so what is worse than a pie chart? A 3D pie chart. <laughs> There are whole corners of the internet dedicated to criticizing the misleading visualizations used in Apple keynotes. So if you wanna have some fun going down that Google rabbit hole, there's a lot to see there. So notice here how the pie is tilted just right to make Apple's 19.5% market share appear larger than the 21.2 slice. Is that unintentional? Probably not. And then the donut chart, it may be a prettier or a cooler version of the pie chart, but it's actually even harder to interpret because the angles have been removed. So now instead of visually comparing angles, we're left to compare arc lengths that don't have a common origin. So you'd probably be better off looking at them this way, but those curves are still not doing us any favors in distinguishing the relative differences between the arc lengths. And then of course, 3D donuts, are even worse. Look, all of these rules have exceptions. I'm not here to tell you that it's never right to make a pie chart. Sometimes they are appropriate, but I am gonna go ahead and tell you on the record today that it is never appropriate to make a 3D donut chart. So please don't do that. <laughs> um, and really with very few exceptions, 3D charts are highly discouraged. While bar charts are one of the most dependable and easy to read visualizations, when drawn in 3D, they become hard to decipher. Like here, which edge am I supposed to be comparing to the axis? Or over here, what's hiding behind that bar? Nobody knows. This data could have been represented with much less chart junk, as Edward Tufte calls it, by just drawing the charts in 2D. Drawing them in 3D added absolutely no value. And in fact, it just kind of obstructed our ability to clearly see the data. Another way to obscure the trusty bar chart is to remove its origin. So it's really important that bar charts always start from a zero origin. And that's because we're perceiving relative length. So in the example on the left, the pre-operative value appears to be less than half of the post-operative value. When in fact, the difference is much less severe when we look at the correct chart on the right. And sometimes people will ask me, well, what if the difference in value of the bars is very small? And then I will tell them that it should look very small. You can't just change the, the origin of the axis to make the differences look more distinguishable. If they are very similar values, then they should look like very similar heights. The next chart faux pas is using lines to connect arbitrary categories. So with few exceptions, line charts should only be used to visualize change in values over a continuous variable like time or distance. Using lines to connect discrete categories like states in this example just doesn't really make sense. 
So again, a bar chart would be a much more appropriate way to represent values by state. And here's our last chart crime of the day. There's this great website called uh, WTF Viz, and people submit lots of misleading, incorrect, or otherwise terrible visualizations. And this one's a great example. So while line charts, like I said, are a great way to visualize change over time, this one is doing a terrible job. So if you take a close look, we're looking at changes in murder and homicide cases reported over time. And at first glance, it looks like crime has significantly decreased, which is great, right? But if you take a closer look, each data point represents the count of crimes reported by one full year, except for the last two data points. The second to last one counts only crimes from January to June, so that's about six months of data. And the last data point counts only from July 1st to August 3rd, so that's just one month of data. Of course that line is gonna slope down. It's actually, it, I would hope it would slope down more than that comparing one month to a full year. So it's hard to believe that this mistake was unintentional, but we have to be really careful to make sure that we know how to interpret visualizations so that we're not misled like this. And also so that we can create honest visualizations and not mislead our audiences. So now that you've had a little crash course on some of the do's and don'ts of data viz, let's take a look at how we can effectively use data visualization throughout the spatial analysis workflow. So in addition to visualizing our data in 2D maps or in 3D scenes, we can also use charts throughout the spatial analysis process to visualize distributions and frequency, uh, category comparisons, relationships and correlations, and change over time or distance. So these are the four kind of main buckets I like to think about that we use data visualization for. So distributions helps us understand the numerical shape of our data. Most of us are familiar with the importance of visualizing spatial distributions, assuming that since we're at an Esri talk, but visualizing distributions in data space can be equally as important. So we can see if our data is normally distributed by looking at a histogram and get a better sense of how representative the averages are to the whole. So when data is normally distributed, the mean, median, and mode are all roughly the same. When we ask for the mean of a set of values, we want a number that represents the whole data set, right? But if our data is not normally distributed, the mean is actually not representative of the whole. So for example, um, there's a joke by a comedian that I like called Bo Burnham, and he says that the average person has one fallopian tube. So that's true. Right, most people have either zero or two. So if you're gonna average that out, the average person is gonna have one, but very few people actually only have one. And so that average is not representative of the actual data set because we have a bimodal distribution. And we'd be able to see that if we visualized our data in a histogram. If we just blindly used that average as a representative value, we would not really be um, doing a good job of understanding our data. We can also use box plots as a way to visualize and compare distributions across different categories. We can use bar charts to compare and contrast amounts and part to whole relationships, like we see on the right with those stacked bars. It's a good alternative to something like a pie chart. We can visualize relationships between numeric variables and calculate linear trends using scatter plots. And we can visualize trends and cycles over time using line charts, data clocks, and calendar heat charts, which we'll take a look at. So I'll quickly just talk about this, um, this little section I like to call when a map alone isn't the best option. So I think it's safe to say given Again, that we're at an Esri talk that most of us here understand the value of visualizing our data on a map. But there are some instances when a map could really benefit from some companion visualizations. So state maps are a great example of this. Please let the record show I will never tell you not to make a map. 
but state maps on their own can be a little frustrating to me sometimes. Because usually in the case of state data, the location of the state is not really the most meaningful attribute. Maps are most insightful when they highlight the first law of geography, that things that are closer together are more related than things that are farther apart. But in the case of states, the relationships are often more political than spatial and where the state is physically located is usually not the most important piece of information. And because of their vast range in shape and size and population densities, a state map alone isn't the best way to visualize this data. So on this map, some of the smaller states are very hard to see. And just by looking at the map, can you tell which state has the highest value? No, but a bar chart in conjunction with the map helps clarify those relative amounts and unobscure data hidden in small states. So we can already see which bar is the tallest, but if I were to sort this, then it makes it even easier to understand. It makes those relative differences even more apparent. Here's another classic example of why we can't just blindly rely on summary stats. These four data sets are called Anscombe's Quartet. A statistician named Francis Anscombe created these to demonstrate the importance of exploring your data through visualization before analysis. So all four of these data sets have the exact same sum, mean, median, standard deviation, and R-squared values. So we would expect them to be essentially the same, right, or very similar if all of their descriptive stats are equal. But if we visualize these data sets, we see that they are in fact dramatically different. And we would have never known this without plotting these values on a scatter plot. And then lastly, when trying to understand temporal data, a map alone is usually not the best option. So here I have a, a map showing change in, in 911 calls in Baltimore over time. And you can kind of just see that animation flashing points on and off. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I know anything about how those calls have changed over that time by just looking at this map. So something like a line chart would be a great addition to help us really understand those changes. So let's take a look at some demos of Charts in Pro and in ArcGIS Online. So we'll move over to start here in Pro. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay. Really, I could talk about this for like five hours. So I'm talking really quickly because I want to get a lot in. So please excuse how quickly I'm going. There are resources that we'll provide at the end so that you can dig into this a little bit deeper, but I'm hoping just to inspire you to want to learn more. Um, okay, so switching over here to Pro, I have this data set looking at uh, election data from 2016 by county. So in this map, I'm looking at voter turnout. Each county has a, a percent of voter turnout and we have it symbolized so that the counties in purple have very low voter turnout and the counties in green have high voter turnout. And so I might wanna understand the patterns in voter turnout if I want to affect change and maybe it, um, influence some of the counties with low voter turnout to start voting more in the future. So the first thing I always do when I get a data set with numeric values is to create a histogram. So I'm gonna look at my variable of interest here, which is voter turnout. And now I can see the distribution and we have a pretty normal looking distribution. We see that nice bell curve. Our, our mean value is here with this blue line. Um, we can see in our stats table, it reports all of these great stats, mean, median, standard deviation, and then everything else, including skewness, kurtosis, which are measures of um, normal distribution. I can also interact with this, which is a really important part of the data exploration phase, which I talked about earlier. So exploring, interpreting, and then communicating. So when exploring this, I see that I have a low outlier here. If I select that, I can see that it's this county in Georgia that I did some research and it really has historically very low voter turnout values. And I can also select on the high end of the tail and see 
those counties that we have really high voter turnout. I could also take a look at the distribution of a different value, let's say uh, per capita income. And now we see that we have a, a bit more skew. We have some counties that have really high income and this makes it a, a positive skew. And highlighting those, we can see kind of where they fall, some on the East Coast and a couple on the West. So the next thing I might wanna do is compare states to each other. So we have this county data, but through charts, I can aggregate and summarize at the state level. So I'm going to create a bar chart. And for my category, I'm gonna choose state. And so we're gonna get one bar for each state. And right now, by default, we're just, the aggregation is count. So we're really just counting how many counties are in each state, which is not particularly interesting. So I'm going to add a numeric field and it's gonna be voter turnout again. And I'm going to, instead of sum, I'm gonna look at the mean. So the average voter turnout by state. And so now we can kind of compare these states to each other. And again, sorting this makes it easier to decipher. So we can see Colorado has the highest average voter turnout while Hawaii has the lowest. But within each state, we can still have quite a bit of variation. So another way to look at this would be to use box plots. So box plots are going to show us the distribution of each category. So again, I choose voter turnout. And then I set my category to state. Now I have one box plot for each state. And I can turn on the outliers here. And we can explore. So we can see here that, for example, let's take a look at uh, Florida. We have you know, a, a kind of an average voter turnout value, but we have some counties with really low values and some with really high. Um, these points, these dots here are outliers. So Texas has some counties with pretty low voter turnout, but then it has some high outliers. And we can select those and see where they fall on the map. And we could also explore this data through scatter plots. So I might wanna look at the relationship between voter turnout and some other variables to see if I might understand what might be related to voter turnout. So let's look at per capita income. So in this scatter plot, we get a linear trend line calculating an R squared of 0.34, which means that per capita income can help explain about 34% of the variation in voter turnout. And you'll also notice that the points in the chart um, match the same colors as the counties in the map since it's a one-to-one, -one, each point being one county. So that's another way to help us include a different variable maybe to have color as like an extra dimension. And when exploring relationships, I usually go for a scatter plot matrix as well, because this allows us to visualize many pairs of relationships at the same time. So it's gonna choose some variables here, voter turnout, age, income, percent of the population who owns a selfie stick, who knows that might be important, some education variables, and let's see, diversity index and see how that looks. So now we get, a scatter plot for each pairwise combination of variables. And I can turn on a linear trend to see a little bit better if we have positive or negative relationships. But I could also choose to view these as R squared or as Pearson's R. So if I view these as R squared, I can now just see which um, cells have the highest relationship. So here we have a 0.34. And that's that per capita income versus turnout that we looked at earlier. Here I have 0.3, and that is the percent of the population who owns a selfie stick versus income. So somehow those two are related with an R squared of 0.3. And I can also sort. So if I want to look at voter turnout, that's my most important variable. I can choose to sort this by R squared. And so now I see in order here on this first column, most related is income, next is median age, next is selfie stick, et cetera. 
So that's a cool way of, of looking at this. And we can even change um, the upper right corner to show scatter plots again, if we want to be able to visualize both at the same time. So a really neat way to explore um, categories, distributions, and relationships in this demo. And the last thing I'll do here is I'm going to publish this web layer to ArcGIS Online because as of recently, we can uh, view charts and create charts in Map Viewer. So I'm just going to give this a tag and I'm going to publish and I'm going to leave it running and go look at a different demo of some temporal data. So let's move over to this map. Here we have car accident data reported from 2010 through 2015. So temporal data, again, we just see a bunch of points on the map. We're really just seeing where we have roads. But to understand this temporally, we're going to need the help of some additional data visualization. So the first thing I do with temporal data is make a line chart. And I'm going to point to my date field. And now we're going to see this kind of seasonal pattern over the years. And we get a default interval size of two weeks. So based on the extent of the data, that there was an algorithm that calculated two weeks. But we could look at this as four weeks, perhaps, if that was um, a more relevant time frame and kind of smooths out that line. And you'll notice that every single one of these data points represents four weeks of data. So we're not going to be misleading like that line chart that I showed you earlier that was comparing full years to months. And we also have this trim and complete interval control, which is important. If I uncheck trim and complete interval, it looks like car accidents just took a quick, sharp decline at the end of 2015. But what really happened is, since we're looking at four week bins, the last bin goes from December 25th, 2015 to January 22nd, 2016. But our data ends on December 31st of 2015. So we have January, 22 days in January that we just don't have any data for that are empty. So it looks like there are zeros when in fact, we just don't have data. So if we trim this incomplete interval, it removes that last little bit of data so that we don't have that misleading drop in our accounts. I can also look at this using a data clock, which is really neat. So I point to, again, my date field. I'm using years as the rings and months as the wedges. And now we can see cycles and trends. So looking from the inner circle outwards, we have the years from 2010 to 2015. So here, for example, I can see from December how it's changed over the years. But I can also look around at the wedges and see how these values change seasonally. So we can see that kind of July through October, we tend to have the most car accidents. And it looks like it has kind of been increasing over time a little bit. Now, February does have fewer days than other months. So we have to make sure that February doesn't look like it has fewer accidents just because it has fewer days. So another way to look at this would be to split these by weeks here instead of by months. And so now all of the weeks are even, and we can see that still February does have very low values compared to the rest of the year. And the last thing I'll show you here is a, a neat chart type called a calendar heat chart. So I'll move this one up here. So a calendar heat chart allows us to aggregate many years of data into one calendar grid so that we can identify problematic uh, days of the year. Or we can also look at it for uh, as a week day by hour of day. So now we're looking at six years of data in just a one week grid. And it allows us to see those problematic times of day and days of week. So for example, we see here that we see that rush hour pattern here. So kind of between 2 p.m. and 
8 p.m. We have that rush hour in the afternoon. We have a little rush hour in the morning, but we can see that the most car accidents happen on weekend nights. So Friday nights, Saturday nights into early Sunday morning, which kind of intuitively makes some sense. If we look at it again by the year calendar, we, we see that we have, you know, kind of in the middle, like we saw before, the summer months have, have more car accidents. But something else that we can do is summarize a numeric value. So far, we've just been counting how many incidents happen in each of those cells. But I could also choose to, to summarize something. So I'm going to look at the number of drunk drivers associated with car accidents. And now we can quickly see that January 1st and July 4th have the most car accidents associated with drunk drivers, which again, not surprising. Um, it's an interesting finding to see how over six years we get those two holidays sticking out in the calendar. So this is really useful. We got a lot of requests from our crime analyst communities for this type of chart to understand problematic times of day, days of week, and days of year. And then I know I'm running out of time, but I would like to quickly show you a little bit of COVID data. So we can, through Pro, we can um, make charts through notebooks now as well. So I pulled in some COVID data from New York Times and I'm looking at um, from January 1st of 2020 through this past Halloween. So October 31st, 21. And I printed here just, you know, total cases by state, but I wanna take a look at this temporally. So I am going to create a bar chart and I'm gonna use a date field. And now we're just counting how many records happen on each date, not interesting. What I wanna do is summarize new cases. So I'll add my numeric field, aggregation type is sum. And now we see the, that pattern that we've been seeing for the last year and a half. And really I hadn't pulled this data in a while. And I, it's just so sad to see that this peak is again now as high as it was during what we thought was going to be the worst of COVID. I'm going to change this color to something more familiar, how we're used to seeing this. And then I'm gonna turn on a moving average. So a moving average is, is a helpful way to understand this data because as you can see, we have a lot of, of like ups and downs throughout. If I turn this back off, it's kind of like jagged. And that's an artifact usually of how data is collected. So some places may only report data on Mondays, for example. And so we kind of get that weird little pattern. But if we average it out, you, here I'm using a seven day, so a one week average then we can see that smoother line and better understand those patterns. I could also try to understand this data by state. And so I'm gonna use the split by option and split this by state so that we get a different series for each state. And looking at them all in the same chart like this is not really useful, but as of Pro 2.9, so this is not released yet, but it will be released very soon, we can look at this in a grid view. So this is also commonly referred to as small multiples or a trellis. We're calling it a grid. And so now we have one little mini chart for each state. And so we can see the differences in those temporal patterns. Like California, we have you know, a lot of counts and we have that big peak here with the smaller one here. We can see that um, in, let's see, North Carolina, we have a similar pattern, but with a, with a lower kind of count. And then New York, we have a first peak here. So I can show a preview chart and actually examine these one by one and actually make selections in the chart, in the preview chart um, while exploring these different, um, cases, these different states and how they compare it to each other. We can also change the number of mini charts in each grid to kind of adjust that layout and better understand that data. And then the last thing that I'll show you here with the COVID data is the use of a matrix heat chart, which we usually use to compare categories. But in this case, we're gonna look at temporal data. So again, I'm gonna do date and state. 
And then for my number, I'm going to count new cases. So sum of new cases. And now we can see for each state, this kind of linear temporal change. California, we see that we have that big surge here. And we see here in New York, as we all know, was the first state to really get a lot of COVID cases. And we can compare these states to each other through this matrix heat chart. And before I hand it back over, I want to, oh, not this one. I would like to show you ArcGIS Online. And so I'm going to go into the new map viewer. So the old map viewer, the or map viewer classic, does not support charts, but um, the new map viewer does. And we're working to bring all of the functionality from the old map viewer into the new map viewer. Um, but we're not there yet. Analysis will be coming soon. In the meantime, we can start to look at charts in here. So this is that data that I just published. And we can see under our configured charts list, these charts were the ones that I made in pro. So they carried over, they were published with the feature service and we can visualize them here inside of Map Viewer. And we can also make new charts. So right now in Map Viewer, we only support four chart types, but they cover those four main categories that we talk talked about before, bar charts, are for comparing categories, line charts for change, histograms for distribution, and scatter plots for relationships. And we've also recently added the ability to visualize these in an app. So if I were to go through here and save this and then choose to create an app, an instant apps, I can put two charts side by side, and then also interact with those in the application. So this is really that communication part where we are now getting our charts and maps ready to pass on to somebody else to tell a story for them to understand. So I think I'm at time. Uh, that was a really quick tour of charts and I'm happy to take any questions. I hope it wasn't too fast for for everyone to understand, but oh, gosh, I also see Flora. my video has been a little bit problematic. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. It's all about the visualization, Flora. We loved it. <laughs> um, and there's lots of positive comments. That's what 90% of the comments in the chat are just, this is amazing. I want to do this in the classroom. There are a couple of questions though, that uh, we wanted to bring up here. One is that, um, Paul, for example, mentioned, you know, you've, you talked about the pie charts and the ring and the donuts at the beginning, but then you looked at the data clocks, which I thought were fascinating. Could you maybe reflect for a moment on, you know, the value of, 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 of both of those things, you know, given the fact that you were saying, okay, you know, use these sparingly, use them when appropriate, but yeah, what about this in light of what you said at the beginning? That's a really good question. So data clocks are showing part to whole relationships, just like a pie chart or a, a donut chart would. But in the case of the data clock, every single cell is the same size. So we're not trying to visually compare, I'm like using hand gestures now and you can't see me. We're not trying to visually um, compare the size of these cells we are just looking at their value through color. So we have a, a classification scheme here, just like we would with, um, with a map classification. We can see the histogram of the breakdown of what gets to be dark blue and what's light blue. And so in that way, it's, it's a little bit different from a pie chart. Of course, it's still, you know, it's not perfect because 2010 has a smaller ring than 2015, but we typically think of things that happened more recently to be a little bit more important than things that happened in the past, but it's still a way of comparing those without having to um, try to visually distinguish their size. Mm. Yeah, thanks for the thoughtful comments. Much appreciated. Andy is wondering, I, Andy might want to clarify, but a, a bit earlier, maybe about eight minutes ago, can you perform raster algebra on the grid that you were showing them? Andy, you might want to chip in here. Oh, Joe, that was a joke. <laughs> oh, okay. You can't, you, not a trellis, but a grid, but we use grid in other ways. In, in our right. Grid. Oh, you were talking about that. Oh, okay. Yep, I'm with you now. Okay. The jokes <laughs> don't come over very well in the chat box. Right. Well, you know, that is a good opportunity for me to mention that Pro does also have raster charts. And 
I am not the product engineer that works on those, but if you are working with raster, there are a series of raster charts in pro that are also really useful. Thanks. Uh, for as long as I'm, I'm talking, got your attention here, uh, that chart that you're showing right now, the top chart, if you could represent this as the year on the, on the X axis and the months on the Y axis and stack it that way, I think that would solve the issue with the uh, data clock, you know, or vice versa, you know, year, yeah. on, year on the Y axis and month on the X axis. Yeah, definitely. That would be another alternative to, to seeing this. So part of the reason that the data clock is nice is because we do have you know, January and December, it's a circle. So we don't ever have like that cutoff on either side, but you're right. If we want to avoid having cells of different sizes here, we could make that into a, a flat rectangular grid. Also, yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone. Uh, Kate, you might want to clarify this one. Kate was wondering about which, which charts from, from, Pro can be published into online. Uh, Kate, you want to do audio and fill in the details? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's only uh, four charts that are available in ArcGIS Online. So if I created a time chart like you had and I published my map, would that publish out for viewing or would that just be dropped from, uh, from when I published the map in the feature layer? That is a good question and it would be dropped. So right now you can only view these four chart types in Map Viewer. And as we continue every release, we're adding new chart types. We hope to eventually have full parity with Pro. But right now, if you, for example, make a data clock and then you publish that layer, it's just not going to be there in, in Map Viewer. Will you will you get a um, a blank box or it just it just no. it just it, you just, okay, it just won't be there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it gotcha. just doesn't get saved with a feature service at all. So on the pro side, we have it turned off. It mm. just never makes it to Map Viewer. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, Ann Johnson, our, our, our colleague there, former uh, ESRI education teammate. Hey, Ann, uh, I was wondering about, you know, you mentioned explore, communicate, but then you mentioned another thing. I think it might've been toward the beginning about, you know, your three goals. What was the third mm -hmm. one? It was interpret analysis. So that was in the middle. And because we didn't have a lot of time, I didn't really go into that. Um, but there are a lot of GP tools that output charts as part of their results. So for example, like a, a multivariate clustering analysis outputs box plots to help you understand the characteristics of each cluster. Um, but since we only had 40 minutes, I didn't have right. time to dive into those, but it's definitely, part of how we um, explore, export and explore our GP tool results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Also, I just want to remind people that we did have a higher education chat with our colleague Zara back in January. And that is of course archived. So Zara explored in a brief way, 45 minutes-ish, the capabilities of the new map viewer in ArcGIS Online. So you might want to check that out This is if this is your first exposure. But I know many of you have, have done it, but I just want to point that out. OK, gosh, I know, uh, Flora, this is something where we could have the whole afternoon on <laughs> this and just barely touch on it. it there's so many amazing capabilities. I, as I expected, I learned some new things from you as well. And I mean, for education and beyond, this is just fascinating. And, you know, touching on many of the points that people were raising, use the most appropriate tools for the job, understand your data, know about real, understand totals versus proportions, and also think about the aerial size of the units that you're mapping. I mean, all those things that we love about GIS, you're touch well, many of the things you're touching on, that it's not just the tools. It's all these other conversations and considerations and critical and spatial thinking that we're fostering while we're teaching with these tools. That's what's, that's what's so rich about this all, isn't it? And that's what a lot of the comments uh, made me think of. All right, lots more positive comments uh, flowing in here. 
Flora, I don't want to keep you. We do have a few more minutes, folks, uh, and Flora has graciously uh, agreed to be on here for, for 60. But um, if anybody's got anything further to add, we'll, um, we'll take those questions. But if not, let's just pause for a moment and I will scan the trail Wait, in here. the meantime this is uh something yep. i was going to show but didn't i didn't think i was going to have the time and i can just quickly show um our matrix heat chart i showed a temporal version of it looking at covid by state but it's also useful for looking at categories so this is looking at um, basketball games and forgive me i don't really know anything about basketball but we have the winning team on the um y-axis, the losing team on the x-axis, so we can compare and see, okay, so MIA won against CHA four times, and, um, or, you know, and then I can look at these, uh, this bar chart is filtered by selection, so we're only looking at those games that happened between those two teams um, in that intersection, so it's another cool way of looking at categories. Indeed, thanks, and it's another great example of mixing up the the data sources to intrigue students from all walks of life and all backgrounds in this that's what's that's what's great about modern gis right there's there's no shortage of data sure understand it but incorporate some natural hazards some sports some uh sociological variables lots of different things in your courses to uh just add that at variety um okay Thanks for the comments, folks. Uh, yeah, one of the other ones I wanted to mention, Flora, the car accident data. Do you have a link? Jay is wondering about that. Is that part of a like a learn lesson or something like that that people can go and grab that data? The car accident data. It's publicly available. It's called FARS Fatal Accident. Uh, I'm not sure what the rest is, but it is something that I pulled from. Uh, a server oh. a while ago. I think Andrew's got the link here from the national yes, reporting um, system. Thank system. you, Andrew. Yep. Yeah, many thanks. And for our basketball fan, here's an example of an, uh, an analysis where it's density-based clustering of made shots. I think these are Steph Curry's made shots. And the scatter plot here helps us interpret that analysis result looking at how these clusters are formed based on their reachability distance. So again, I'm not really going into how this works, but it's a neat example of this. This chart is created automatically when you make a density-based clustering analysis. Indeed. I got word from my colleague, Ken Serena, that she might not be able to connect her audio. So uh, Ken Serena, though, uh, is 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 listening, and she and I are are the hosts of this. We really appreciate Flora's contributions to our entire community and our spatially enabled brains today. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, Flora, maybe we could have you back next year for a deeper dive in one I'd of these higher that. ed chats. That would be an intriguing idea. I think people would be loving that. Um, but in the meantime, folks, we do have, I put it in the chat box, it might have gotten buried by now, but as Ken Serena mentioned at the beginning of the hour, we have Arcade in December. That will be Tuesday, 7 December, same time, same location, register the same way, getting to know ArcGIS Arcade and how it leverages in various applications, how you can build queries on it, how you can do symbolization with it, et cetera. So we've got a couple of solutions engineers here to talk about that. And then even more related to today's discussion, what's new with spatial statistics tools in ArcGIS Pro? We've got a couple of our dear friends and colleagues to do that in January. That's right after New Year's. So maybe write a note to self so that you don't miss that uh, before for January on this, what's new with spatial stats. And throughout 2022, we have others that we're thinking about, but this is a community. So if you've got an idea for what you really would like to see in this higher ed chat, um, you know how to get a hold of Ken Serena and I, and we'll put our emails in the chat box here just in case you don't. 
uh, let us let us know what you're thinking because we're we want this to be relevant and valuable to the entire community. So thanks folks. Thanks Flora once again for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. All right, folks, you all have a great day. Go out there and be spatial. <laughs>